Hello, everyone. Bill Wilson, Senior Editor for Supermarket News, here with another episode of Supermarket News Off the Shelf. And with me today is the CEO of Save a Lot, Leon Bergman. Leon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And Save a Lot has, has a big pivot going on right here. Um, you know, they're going to, I believe you're going to be more of a pure wholesaler. And maybe you can start off by uh, talking about that. And the simple question is, why now? Why this pivot? So, you know, uh, we have pivoted to being a licensed wholesaler, um, slightly different than a pure wholesaler, given that we own the format and, and the trademark uh, bill. But, you know, it really allows us to focus on providing the right core offering and the right framework for all of our entrepreneurial independent retailers to succeed. And um, and our priority is to enable their growth and profitable market share. So when, when you look at it, uh, our independent retail partners are the closest to their markets, their best position to meet the needs of their customers every day. So putting all of the stores into their hands means that we can focus 100% on providing them the right mix, the best cost of goods, and help them drive sustained profitable growth. So, you know, we layer that on with specific promotions and the way they know their customers, the way they interact with their customers, the way they serve their customers, the way they itemize their stores. You know, I'm, I'm extremely confident in our ability to partner with these great operators and drive the best business possible. You know, we're in a very unique position um, to localize and truly add something to people's lives in these trade areas. And, and that's a very powerful model. So. Um, so has this been in the works for a while? Um, has this been a goal for you for 2023? No, it, it began in 2020, late 2019, maybe, Bill, um, before I was here. Um, I was fully aware of it and fully aligned with it when I came on board. I think it's the right move. You know, our, our independent retail operators are so good at what they do. It, it's very difficult to um, to imitate that. And, and the way they operate and the way they own those locations and the way they drive the results is extremely impressive. It's just up to us to give them the right format and the right program that they can build around and um, and the sky's the limit. So I was fully on board with this strategy, yes. So talk about more of a, a freshness angle. Um, I believe you're gonna, you're gonna take more of a fresh ag angle here. What does that entail? You know, we, we have um, a, a great perimeter offering um, supplemented by a very strong center store um, private label offering as well but everyone knows the perimeter drives trips and and everyone knows that especially um in food deserts that fresh healthy foods should not be taken for granted and you know we have a great meat program um our stores cut meat in the stores which is becoming a little bit of a lost art but the freshness is second to none um, you know, we, we have um, a very strong produce program as well. So we give people healthy choices at discount prices and we do it in their trade areas. So, so ultimately, when, when we look at it, you need a strong center store contribution as well, but you need to um, provide people the right choices and make them feel good about shopping at your locations. And, and our retail partners give people those choices. They give them a great shopping experience and they make it easy for them to feel great about saving money and feeding their families. So, so what are you going to do from the marketing perspective as far as branding all of this? Uh, because I mean, Save A Lot does have kind of a, you know, a tone that it does carry, uh, you know, cheap food, uh, you know, more like snacky food and stuff like that. I'm not the one that gave it that tone for sure. I, I know that it's much more than that, but um, there is a perspective out there. And I'm just more curious, are you going to change up your marketing strategy to reflect more of this freshness approach and high quality approach? You know, we are, but it's all tactical, Bill, you know, versus say brand marketing, that's super expensive. But, you know, what, what I would say is 
when when someone goes into our stores and they try our products, like I am extremely proud of the quality of all of our private label product. It it, it is national brand equivalent or better. You, you pick up our canned veg, you're not getting stems and pieces. You're getting grade A, a quality product. And um, and and the great thing is, our shoppers realize that. The challenge, to your point, is overcoming some of those perceptions, which I think are misguided, but nonetheless, they're perceptions that we need to overcome. So, so it's a combination of calling that out, that value proposition in store. It's also um, better targeting our digital marketing to bring new people in the stores, because once they try it, they'll realize how easy it is to save money with us. That being said, we need to get them into the store to try it. So, and, and hence the beauty of digital marketing, Bill. So are you guys going to be offering anything organic? You know, we, we do have some organic products. Um, we're, we're a fast follower on a lot of things being limited assortment, Bill. So we haven't gone overboard with that. It's more of a localized offering. You know, some trade areas support that better than others, quite frankly, based upon price points and disposable income. So, so we do support that, but that's on a store by store basis. So. So talking about the store by store uh, strategy there, are the prices going to vary based on the location? Um, how are you going to keep those prices low and affordable, especially from the freshness part of it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, pricing will vary by location and or by um, what we call retail partners, our independent retail operators. Um, but, but they're generally driven by different circumstances. For instance, if I have a store with a high lease rate and a higher occupancy cost, obviously they need a little bit more gross margin to support that store. You know, if I have a store with a high security expense, you know what? That needs to be priced in. If I have to have armed guards at a store, you name it. Um, you know, what I would say though is overall, those stores are providing a better value than anyone else anywhere near them. The, the variance is based upon operating expenses. And, and the other thing I would say, by taking that tact, that makes these stores sustainable. You know, how, how many times do you see people either exit an area or quite frankly, not reinvest in a store? Um, you know, we've done a tremendous amount of remodels in stores that are in, you know, food deserts, whether they're um, urban food deserts, whether they're rural food deserts. And, and historically, um, people in food deserts don't invest a lot back in their stores. By and large, our retail partners do. So, you know, I, I think it all has to come together to provide the best value to each trade area based upon what, what's, um, what the operating costs are in that trade area, but also do it in a way where we're going to be there for a long time. And, and that's the beauty of our model is, you know, we, we turn the product fast, that keeps it fresh. We, um, we, we don't have 30 to 40,000 SKUs, we have 3,500 SKUs. So it allows us to focus on cost of goods and provide a great value to the people in that trade area. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in stores and I've actually had someone come up to me, especially after a store has been remodeled and thank me. And you know, I'll tell you, if that doesn't give you goosebumps, I'm not sure what will. So, yeah, so um, you know, we talk about, um, you know, this pivot and can you talk about the investment that has gone into this? If you don't want to get into dollar figures, that's okay. But I mean, how long do you think it's going to take to really pay off with this kind of pivot? You know, I, I actually look at it as as more of a um, shared opportunity cost, Bill, because, you know, we, we've had stores that, um, you know, sometimes needed investments. So, you know, we've co-invested with, with some of our new retail partners to upgrade these stores. In the past three years, over 50 percent of our stores have been remodeled, which is fairly remarkable. But but we've done it with. Our, our retail partners. And, and that tells you that A, they believe in the model and B, we believe in them. So, so it's been a co-investment and, and it's been really gratifying to see. So 
All right. Um, so another question I had, more of a general question, uh, not related specifically to save a lots, but uh, or what you're doing, you know, as far as being a wholesaler. Um, food deserts. Uh, do you think this problem is getting worse in this country or do you think it's improving? I, I don't have the numbers in front of me to say that it's it's getting worse. What I would say is anecdotally and what my gut tells me is it's not getting better. Um, you know, it, it, it's obvious that there's a large segment of the population that are really striving to stretch their food dollars as we speak. And, and that's, you know, a result of inflation. It's a result of the decrease in SNAP benefits as all of the emergency allotments and special stimulus programs related to the pandemic have seized. Um, and, and it's painful for, for lower income people out there. And, and they're doing everything they can to stretch their food dollars. You know, they're trading down to different types of proteins. You know, they'll, they'll trade from beef to pork when pork's cheap. They'll trade from steaks to grinds. You know, um, the, the last 10 days of the month, they're really looking for anything that provides um, a lower price point that is going to, you know, not um, that's going to satisfy their families and not have people go hungry. Um, and, and that struggle is real. Um, you know, so so ultimately, I, I think there's you know, I, I can't specifically comment on whether there are more or less food, food deserts. Um, I, I know there'd be. 230 roughly plus additional food deserts if it weren't for save a lot and I take a lot of pride in that because we, we can make a difference in people's lives but even beyond the food deserts I think food insecurity is obviously rising so my follow-up question to that is you know in, in a country like America why is the problem not improving um, you know why are people still having trouble? getting access to food to fulfill their daily needs? So that's a, that's a tough question for me to answer. Um, but what I would say is, I think there's, there's no easy solution. Obviously, if there were, we would have solved it as a nation. Um, you know, you, you have, you know, a, a disparity as far as food deserts go and, and lack of fresh and affordable options that we do our best to try to contribute our solution to, um, but but you also have you know differences in in both government programs, uh, especially at the state levels, and and then you have um, the food banks themselves, and and I think that the food banks are doing an admirable job. Are are they the most efficient way to do this? I'm not sure they are, you know. And and the other big thing is, they're not always the most consistent solution you know the their their offerings vary based upon the donations that they receive and everything else so when when you put all of this together there, there's just so many moving pieces that it's not an easy solution um i wish it were um you know i i don't know i i just think it, it's 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 um a, a difficult proposition when you're when you're faced with choices of you know, do you feed your family? Do you put gas in your car so you can go to work? You name it. Um, you know, uh, thank goodness, um, you know, you and I aren't in that situation, but a lot of people are. And and I think there's a lot of well-intentioned programs out there, but to your point, there are still challenges. So talk about grocery price inflation in general as well. Do you think it's reached this peak? Do you think it's going to start to go down? What's your feeling on that? You know, uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's reached its peak. And and even if it has plateaued, I, I think it's moderated. I don't think it's going to be anywhere near the level it was, Bill. But but I'm but I'm fearful that we will see still see pockets of inflation. Number one, and number two, outside of commodities, I don't see a lot of opportunity for price deflation. Um, you know, so so even without absent inflation, it's still a higher price basis than the consumers had two years ago. You know, that being said, you know, we do see an increase in promotional activity. So while that's not technically deflation, it does make food more affordable when people can shop deals. So are you doing anything with technology um, 
at your safe fulfillment centers that's going to really help you deliver product faster? Um, we're uh, at our fulfillment centers themselves. We're doing the the standard upgrades on you know warehouse management systems, transportation management systems, things like that. As far as if you're referring to automation, um, no, we we haven't found the right ROI for our operations on that. And you know, quite frankly, part of that reason is we're a limited assortment warehouse. Okay. You know, um, we don't have the proliferation of SKUs that other people have. So, you know, that makes the ROI hurdle higher for us. Do you see that happening though? Do you see that ROI becoming, you know, appealing at some point? I I do. Uh, I think it as the um, adoption rate increases and as economies of scales kick in on automation, I do see it becoming um, potentially applicable at some point. You know, what I don't know is, is that point in five years? Is it in eight years? You know, my crystal ball, quite frankly, isn't that accurate, Bill. So. And again, on a broader sense, are, are you impressed with how technology has kind of exploded in this market sector in grocery in general it just seems like it's really has taken off over the last 12 months you know it has and um and, and i think you know there's an old saying necessity is the mother of invention uh, i think a lot of it's driven by a scarcity of labor and and you know i feel this is a tremendous industry i love working in this industry it's not the most glamorous industry, Bill. So, you know, as as people are looking at career paths and 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 you know, kids out of high school or college or are looking at potential jobs, this isn't always their first choice. And that's an unfortunate thing because it's a great industry filled with so many great people. Um, and and when people get into our industry, a lot of times they stay. But it is difficult to attract people. And I think that's you know, that need is what's driving a lot of this adoption. And, and I think it's opening a lot of eyes to what some of the um, possibilities are. Anything else you want to add about uh, this move with save a lot or anything? You know, you know, just that I'm really proud of our retail partners, our independent retailers. I, I think this is a format that's really well positioned and is on trend with everything going on in the industry. And, and ultimately, I feel fortunate to be a part of it. Um, we, we have great independent retailers that we're working with. We have a great format. And, um, and uh, you know, and ultimately, we're in a position to add something to people's lives in all of these trade areas in which we operate. And, um, and, and that, you know, it, it's a powerful combination. It's a great feeling. And I just feel thankful to be here, Bill. All right, Leon Bergman, CEO of Save-A-Lot, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you.